Hi, welcome to our Centro Church online service. We're so glad that you could join us today, whether it's the first time you've watched or whether you're re-watching because you enjoyed the message. Hey, if this is your first time joining us today, there's a little QR code that's coming up on your screen right now. If you could scan that one, there's a new to Centro section or link that you can click and you can fill out your information and one of our team will get in touch with you. There's also a number of other links that you can click to explore as well. We know that you'll be so blessed by our message today and you'll see us again at the end of the service. So why don't we check out today's message? Brilliant, excellent. Well, it's good to be with you. Thank you, Pastor. Tim and Kat, really appreciate the uh, opportunity and the invitation to be with you here this morning. And it's so good to see so many of your familiar faces and so of course some faces that uh, are not so familiar and some faces that are very hard to see from up here with these lights in your eyes. But anyway... There you have it. <laughs> and uh, as uh, was just mentioned, we've been leading ACCI now for nearly two and a half years. It was also, also this, we didn't organise this either, but it's the third year. This is the, the, this is the anniversary. This was the Sunday that we handed the, this church over three years ago today. And uh, you think to yourself, my gosh, what happened to that three years, right? But... Uh, <laughs> Because we're doing some incredible things, some amazing things, and um, a couple of uh, a couple of initiatives of ACCI that didn't exist three years ago, but that uh, exist today. Um, one of them is our intern program. So uh, this is a program that's fundamentally aimed at, at young people in their in their twenties who are looking for a, an extra challenge, and uh, we're placing them in a a, a a missions environment for six months in one of our great locations around the world, and they do a 40-hour online training course, and then uh, they leave their church for six months. They get uh, all kinds of ministry experience, all kinds of cross-cultural experience. Then they come back on fire and serve in their local church. If that's something that interests you or something that you know someone that might interest, our first cohort of interns go, goes out as, as it happens in two weeks' time. So uh, this is a, a, a fresh concept, a fresh brand new idea that we've introduced to the movement and uh, that's taken root and the first uh, fruit of that um, is manifest in just two weeks from today. Another thing too that we've done that didn't exist um, three years ago, I wonder if, if you've all got a phone, if anyone's got a phone, could you get your phone out and open up your camera? If you could just do that for me, take your phone, open up your camera, all right, hang on a minute, just make sure my hair's good and... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you, you need an updated photo of me. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, we put that uh, QR code on the screen. Um, can I say this? The Lord of the harvest, um, we were asked to pray. Jesus said to pray this prayer. Now, the Lord's prayer, you know, our Father of chart in heaven, he didn't say pray that. He said pray after this manner. Right? So this is, this is a, a manner or this is a, a template for prayer. When it comes to this prayer, he said to pray this prayer. My question to you is, when was the last time you did what Jesus told you to do and pray this prayer? <laughs> and the answer is probably some time ago, right? And the reason for that is it's not a felt need. You don't really feel the need to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into the harvest field. <laughs> let, let me give you some, some idea of where we're at as a nation as opposed to some other people groups in the world. The brown people in India versus the Aussies in Australia. Did you know that if every evangelical Christian in Australia prayed for seven different people, just seven, that's not hard. Everyone, in, every evangelical, every Christian could pray for seven people, surely, right? If every evangelical in Australia prayed for seven people, every single person in Australia could be prayed for. Can you believe that? It's amazing. It's, that's how many evangelical Christians there are in Australia. Now, if I was to take the Debraham people in India, and I was to say, how many would every evangelical Christian, not just nominal Christian, evangelical Christian, how many would they have to pray for so that every person in that people group would be prayed for by name? How many do you think? In Australia, it's seven. In the Debraham people, it's not 14. No, a thousand. It's not a thousand. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a hundred thousand. <laughs> Every evangelical Christian would have to pray for 120,000 people. <laughs> right? You can see that we need 
more harvesters in the harvest field. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I know that, you know, your neighbors and your loved ones and your relatives need Jesus. I understand that. But you've got to appreciate the different dynamic that happens. We, we take so much for granted in this country. And we need to be praying to the Lord of the harvest. Because if we don't send out more harvesters into the harvest field, that harvest will die on the vine. It won't be brought in. And so I'm raising up an army of a 1,000 people who are going to be praying every month to the Lord of the Harvest. I'll send you an email, not a very long email. It'll mention one un unreached people group in the world, a few other things so that you can pray for them. That's all. You can email once a month. If you um, scan that QR code there, put in your details, you can email from me every month saying, hey, we're praying for this unreached people group. Pray the Lord of the Harvest to send forth harvesters into the harvest field. And if we can get thousand people doing that across the nation, right? Maybe praying for 10 minutes. Think of how many hours of prayer that is where we do what Jesus told us to do, <laughs> right? It's, it's not that, it's not, you know, it's not that difficult. All you got to do is scan that QR code on the screen, put in your details, and that will happen um, as of next month because uh, February's came out last month, last week, I should say. So uh, from March on, you'd get the email, along with, I don't know, there's 700 and something people already signed up. So when I say my goal is to get 1,000, we're getting real close. And I reckon if everybody in this room did it, we might even be getting mighty close here this morning. So uh, anyhow, that's all you can do. Scan the QR code, put your details in, cost you nothing, cost you five minutes once a month to do what Jesus told you to do anyhow, right? Not a big ask. So maybe, uh, maybe you could like to do that. That'd be great. I'll remind you to do what Jesus told you to do because most of the time we just forget it, right? We're not opposed to it. I'm not praying to the Lord of the harvest. No way. You don't say that. <laughs> you just forget. Why do you forget? Well, because there's so much going on in your life, right? There's so many difficulties, so many problems, so many issues. You just forget. But don't worry. I'm here to remind you. <laughs> So you can thank the Lord that I came here this morning. Amen. <laughs> I, I don't know whether you've ever found yourself in a situation where you've said, I can't stand it anymore. I, maybe, <laughs> maybe you've been on a diet. I don't know if anyone can relate to this, right? Uh, you're on a fast or something, you know, and you, think, you know, I, I'm, and you get that sugary treat that you just love. <laughs> and you walk past the baker and it's wafting up your nostrils and you're hungry and you are sick and tired of being hungry, and you get to that point, you I can't stand this anymore. And you grab that tart, you grab that cake, and I woof it down, and oh, that feels so good. And now I feel so bad. <laughs> but I, I, I couldn't stand it anymore. Well, I don't know how many of you have ever been in the conversation. Somebody, it might have been a group of you or whatever. And it might be at work, it might have been a, a life group at church, who knows, and, and, and people are talking and this guy, he's, you know, he's, he's rabbit and on, honestly. He thinks he's waxing eloquent, but he's driving you crazy because he keeps saying stuff and you know it's not true. <laughs> and he says something and he's, you know, he's speaking himself up and you go, oh, I'll let that go. He does it again and you think, oh, I'll let that go. <laughs> and he does it again and you think, oh, I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> And, and eventually you just, you know, you blow because you, you know, you sort of, you were patient, you hung on, you were patient, you got to a point where that was the end. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a situation where you've been tempted, you know, you've been trying to give that up, you've been trying to turn your back on that, you've been trying to deal with it, but again, it just keeps you up growing, it comes, comes to your heart, comes to your mind, it, it grows within you and you get to a point where you think, that's it, I can't stand it anymore, and boom, you let your guard down and you, you let that thing back into your life. I think that we feel this a lot more than we say it. Uh, and it has to do with things like not just, you know, food and a diet, but disappointment, um, forgiveness, all kinds of things that we give, we give, we give, we try to do the right thing, and then we get to a point where we go, boom, I can't stand it anymore. I've had a gut fall. We're going to take a look at something this morning, which I think is nothing short of absolutely remarkable. Uh, it's a message from Jesus himself to a group of people who had to stand. <laughs> Boy, did they have to stand. i got to tell you. Did they have to stand in a day of temptation? Did they have to stand in a moment 
of adversity. And Jesus says something to them. The resurrected Jesus, the ascended Jesus, this was after his earthly ministry. And he, from his throne room in heaven, says these specific words to a group of people who had to stand. They couldn't say, I can't stand anymore because they had to continue to stand. And here's the thing. If you want to be somebody who's standing, right? If you want to be somebody who at the end of the journey can look back and said, I might have made some mistakes, but I'm still standing after all this time. <laughs> you want to be able to say that? Because the truth of the matter is, folks, there's a lot of people who throughout the process, throughout the journey, get to a point where they can't stand anymore. These people, they, they, they stood. And we're going to see why Jesus said something to them that was, I think, within it were the seeds of their capacity to stand. We're going to look at it a moment and hopefully uh, hear it ourselves. Before I get to that, and just to build your interest perhaps in what he had to say a little bit more, I have a transcript from a conversation from that era, a historical transcript from the people who heard the words that we're about to look at from Jesus. And we see the fruit of those words in their life. This is an actual historical record. Six men were dragged before the pro-council in Rome and were asked, will you worship the emperor? The men said in reply, We've committed no theft. We pay our taxes and we honor the emperor, but we worship Christ. The pro council's response was, you have 30 days to think about this. <laughs> Go away, talk it over with your family, talk it over with your loved ones, and come back in 30 days. If you don't change your mind, you're making your own decision to end your life. To which they replied, we don't need your 30 days, sir. <laughs> Since you have refused and, you, can, and you, you continue to worship Christ, you've chosen your own death and you'll be put to the sword. To which the men replied, right? You've got to get this. This is, you've got to ask yourself, right? What happens inside of a man's heart to be able to do this? To which the men replied, Thanks be to God. Oh, I don't know about you. That's in shivers down my backbone. <laughs> Thanks be. We're going to put you to the sword. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm not sure what their family said. <laughs> I'm not sure their kids had the same reaction. I don't know. I have no record of that. All I know is that that's what these men said. And so... Surely we've got to find out what's going on inside their hearts, right? Surely we've got to get to the bottom of what is it that causes somebody to respond like that because I don't know about you, but that gets my honor. That gets my respect. I go, wow. Listen to what Jesus had to say to them before they finished up in that situation and maybe you could get something out of this. There are three things I want you to note as I read this. There is a door, a key, and a pillar. That's the key. A door... A door is opportunity. A key, a key is authority. And a pillar, a pillar is reward. There is a, an opportunity, there is authority, and there is a reward. They are three things that you have to comprehend and understand. And now that I've given you the insight, I'll read the story and we'll discuss it together. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Philadelphia. This is Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David, that's Jesus, <laughs> right? Um, what he opens, that's a really big key, that's a really big deal. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. I know all the things that you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you have obeyed my word and you did not deny me. 
How many know that Jesus is talking to a group of Christians, a group of believers that are suffering persecution? They're, they're having a hard time. Uh, they're going through trials. They're, they're, there's a tribulation factor to their Christian experience. And, and, and what Jesus is saying to them, and what I need you to understand is this, is that in the, the human experience, suffering always has a purpose. Not so with animals. You see, how many know that if your animal is suffering, right, there's no problem. How many know that if an animal is suffering, people will say, put the thing, put it down. The poor animal is suffering. No point continuing on with its life. Let's do it. Let's do the humane thing. Let's put the animal to sleep. Let's put the animal down. And some of you, you know, who have had animals for an extended period of time can remember doing that. Because it was the humane thing to do. It was the right thing to do. Not so with people. Not so with people, folks. You see a person suffering, you don't go, oh, let's do the humane thing and put them down. (laughs) You don't do that. Because in the human experience, as opposed to the animal experience, we are not um, developed animals. We are created in the image of God. For us, suffering has a purpose, right? And the purpose is made clear in the passage that we have just read. You see, Jesus says, even though you are weak, weak means closed doors. So when Jesus talks to these people and he says you're weak, what he's saying to them is that you have had doors closed to you. Now, people in this room, maybe you have felt weak. Maybe you've had doors that you hoped would be opened, but they were closed. And it might have to do with a relationship, or it might have to do with a a work opportunity. It might have to do with some physical aspect that you're experiencing, a, a, a medical matter or whatever. But you know what it's like to have a closed door. What Jesus has just said, and what I need you to understand this morning is this, the way you handle closed doors will determine how many open doors you get. Did you get that? The way you handle closed doors, suffering, persecution, disappointment, whatever you want to you know, explain it, the way you handle that will determine how many open doors come your way. Um, suffering in the human experience never equals no gain if you respond correctly. So the question for us is, is okay, suffering's a given. We've all suffered. We've all had pain. We've all had closed doors, right? Everyone in this room has a closed door. The question is, how do you make the most of that closed door, right? The question is, the closed doors in my life, because closed doors don't necessarily equal open doors, but they can, provided that you respond correctly, provided you understand the process here. Um, I've known people in my life, (laughs) Uh, some come to mind even as I speak. I know two very close friends of mine, pastors, and they had doors slammed in their face in horrible circumstances. And one responded right, one responded wrong. The one responded right has since then walked through a whole bunch of other open doors. The one responded wrong, seriously, folks, is still going through hell. (laughs) Both had closed doors. Both responded. I mean, I could tell you names and dates and faces. I, I can see the. Uh, both had, had doors literally slammed in their face. It was wrong. It was unfair. However you want to articulate it. One knew how to respond. And one possibly knew, but couldn't find the energy to do so. And I can see the difference. This is, you know, I can couple of years down the track now, man, can I see the difference? So could you. So how do you turn these closed doors into open doors? You know, when the Bible talks about open doors, by the way, it's always referring to um, an opportunity for the gospel. And so you might be here today and you might have closed doors at work. You might have closed doors in your family. You might think, my family won't listen to me. You know, they know I'm a Christian. They know I go to church. 
the, the men or the women at work or whatever, you know, they know on oh, yesterday, oh, yeah, we all had a party or whatever. We came, we got drunk and, you know, you spent your time at that silly old church giving all your money and time. What are you doing? And, and, and you might think they disdained you or that they've put you to one side. Let me tell you this. If you have closed doors with people whom you love, you want to lean in this morning and you want to listen because I'm here to tell you, God's going to give you an open door. If you can respond rightly to those closed doors, don't get discouraged. But don't think, oh, well, you know, there's hopeless, there's no point. Don't adopt that position. See, that's what he's talking about to these people here in this, this particular location, right? You know, the, the, the pro council, the, the whole Rome was against them, they were weak, they had no uh, political, no economic power. They were ostracized and pushed to the margins. And Jesus says, the world has closed every door, but I'm going to open a door that no man can close. Because when God opens a door, nobody on the earth can do anything about it. That's what he says to them. And so what's the key? Here's the key, right? You want to listen in. You want to you get this. This literally is the key. If you've ever wanted the key, I'm about to give you the key. This is the key. Are you ready? <laughs> he says this. This is the message from the one holy and true. The one who has the, the key. <laughs> if you wanted the key. Never heard anyone say, I'm going to give you seven keys. <laughs> well, you don't need seven keys. You just need the one key. Because this, this is the message. He says, I'm the one who has the key of David. What he opens no man can close when he closes. What, what does that mean? In my pocket, I have a key. <laughs> That's a key to my car. You know what this tells me? It's still, I have authority over that car. I can give it away. I can drive it where I want to go. I can get it serviced. I could not get it serviced. That car is mine. I have authority over the car. That's what a key is. A key is authority. I got a house key. Why? Because I have a house. I have authority over the house. How do you know that? Because I've got the key. When it says Jesus has the key, what it literally means is he has authority. And here's the deal, right? This is how you respond to suffering. Because how many know suffering can make you more humane, it can make you harder and angrier. Not everybody who goes through suffering comes out the other side uh, more pliable and, and, and more in the image of Christ. Some people go the other way. And the reason for it is the key. They didn't get the key. I've got this morning for you the key. Are you ready for the key? This is the key, folks. I reckon this is the key of life, right? Uh, I think if you get this, you have the key. Jesus has the key. What is the key? When I said before how one person responded and went through open doors and God just blessed and another person, I think the problem is the misunderstanding of the key. You're saying, well, what's this key about? What are you talking about? Give me the key. Can I suggest to you, the key is authority. And the key is recognizing who has the authority in your life. If you think you have the authority, then you don't have the key. <laughs> because, well, you don't realize that he's the one with the key. <laughs> And when you recognize that and you start to structure your life around the one who has the key, the one who has the authority, and you submit yourself to the one who has the key, then that key can open doors that no man can shut. What you've got to realize, what you've got to understand, folks, is that these doors, right, you might be banging and you might be knocking and you might be near, but the doors are locked from the other side. Because he's locked or he's unlocked the door. What you've got to realize, folks, is that he is the one with authority and not you. He is God. I am not. 
When that seeks down into your soul, life makes sense. That's the key. That's the key of life. So many of us are control freaks trying to manipulate and then we get cranky and angry and bitter. It's a, it's a matter of historical fact, folks. Historical fact that the Romans could not believe how the Christians responded to their persecution. They weren't angry with their God. They weren't bitter with the antagonists. They said, thanks be to God. The way they, fit, they dealt with with being tiny, with being weak, with being small, with closed doors, opened doors so dramatically in the Roman Empire that Christianity eventually became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And now, of course, we had the Roman Catholic Church that spans the world. Where did it come from? How did this happen? Folks, it comes back to this, historically it comes back to this whole concept, this whole idea that he has the key and that I don't. You see, I don't know who in this room has got closed doors in their lives and as I said, it, it might be around a, an individual, it might be around a goal, it might be around, it might be just where you are in life. You might have thought, man, I've been so far down the track now, you know, I, Man, I thought I'd be doing this and I'm, I thought I'd have that and I, I thought I'd be in this position and I'm so far behind it and I, I thought I'd be married and I, I thought I'd have kids and, or I thought I'd be this and I, I thought I'd have that job. And I just, I'm, I know we, what you've got to understand is that God has the key. And stop striving. And stop the angst of the heart. And come and say, God, you have the key. The psalmist said, the Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And that's so important. When you recognize who is the light of your salvation, you don't have to fear. You see, if my kids are the light of my salvation, I'm going to be full of fear because they might go off the rails, right? If my relationship is the light of my salvation, I'm full of fear because what happens if something happens to my partner? If my money is the light of my salvation, then I'm so insecure. If my looks are, then I'm, I just don't, what's going to happen? I'm going to get old, so on and so forth. The Lord is the light of my salvation. I fear nothing. I don't know who in this room today is full of fear, anxiety, and worry, but I can tell you this. If you make the Lord the light of your salvation, all fear evaporates. How you deal with closed doors. How you, you, you recognize that suffering has a purpose because Jesus is the author and the finisher of life. You know that word authority and author have the same, the, the, the etymology is the same, they come from the same root place, author, authority. If he's the author of your life, then he's authority, not out of some kind of raw power that he's come and snatched it. He has authority over you because he's the author of you. You see I know many of you know Pastor Wayne, and he passed this church before me, and I'll never forget this. Mark might remember this. We're at this youth rally once, and he was wanted to teach this new song called Fear Not, Fear Not, For God Is With You. You remember that one? Yeah. Anyway, there was, a, there was a guest preacher there, and they had an argument over how the song went. And then the guest preacher said to him, Wayne, it was Phil Pringle, I said, Wayne, uh, I wrote the song. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm the author, therefore I have the authority. <laughs> the minute he told Wayne he wrote the song, how many know? Wayne just backed off. Went, okay, no problem. <laughs> have it your way. <laughs> it's your song. <laughs> how many know that you can, like, you, you, can, you can go to a concert from the author of the song? Right? I don't know. Everyone's going to Tay Tay, right? I don't know how many are going to Tay Tay. And. Uh, People are flying to Singapore because they can't get tickets to Sydney or something. But, you know, they want to go and hear her shake it off, shake it off. <laughs> right? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. You can fill a stadium, the MCG, with 100,000 people because you have authority to sing the song because you wrote the song and the song is your life. You might think, I didn't know he's a Taylor Swift fan. <laughs> I'm not really. <laughs> 
just using this as an illustration of someone who has the authority, because they have the authority, they can fill a stadium. If you get someone who can sing the song, they might have a better voice than her, right? But they might be a tribute to her. They'll be flat out filling the jolly, um, entertain, the, 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 uh, the hall in here in the middle of town. They wouldn't fill this room, right? Because they don't have the authority. When you have authority, you have power. She, that's her song, right? So she has authority. And people fly across the nation to hear her sing it because she has authority. You want authority? Then be the author. You are authentic. You have the most authority when you are authentically you because author, authority, authenticity, all are connected, folks. If you try to project power or try to project some kind of, you know, I'm the boss around here, but you didn't author it, then you don't have it. The reason I'm saying all this is, is coming back to the point, Jesus has authority over you because he's the author of your life. When you understand that, there's no point arguing with him. <laughs> My life should go this way. No, it goes that way. No, it should go this way. Well, I wrote you. Have it your way. <laughs> You're the boss. You have authority. Jesus has authority. It's not, he's not a force dictator. This is the natural rhythm of life. He is the author and the finisher of life. You know, every religion believes their God has the key. Every religion believes their God has authority, right? But let me tell you what makes Christianity different from everything else. Is that within our school of belief, within our structure of belief, we're the only religion on the planet, folks, where our God has been locked out of his own door. Some of you know in the Garden of Gethsemane. See, what I'm saying to you is that when you feel there's a locked door, you have somebody who's also faced a locked door. He knocked on the door, said, you know, take, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want this to happen. But the door was locked. And he suffered. And he suffered not so that you don't have to suffer. He suffered so that he could be like you or that you could be like him. He's, he experienced a closed door. So next time that you experience a closed door, don't be a victim. Don't, don't say life sucks, life's hard. It's not fair. Understand that closed doors have a meaning. And if you can respond to closed doors correctly, and that is recognizing who closes doors and open doors and submit yourself under his authority, then folks, he's going to open a door over your life that no man can close. But you've got to respond to his authority. I said to begin with that there was... Um, there was a key. You understand the key. The key is authority. There's a door, and the door is opportunity. But I also said that there's a pillar. In Roman, uh, Revelation 3.12, and we'll close. It says, all who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I'll write on them the name of my God, and they'll be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. I will also write on them my new name. <laughs> you will be a pillar. In, it's, that's talking about the reward. That's talking about you able to stand when you understand who has the authority and you understand the reward that's coming. <laughs> when, you, when you appreciate the fact that this life is but a vapor. I came across this story the other day and I thought this was so relevant. It was a Japanese prisoner of war camp and they heard that the war was going to be over in two weeks in two weeks' time, the Japanese were going to surrender. They were still in prison camp. They were still being beaten. They still cried. But when interviewed, there was a, an internal laughter because they knew this was going to be over soon. <laughs> they knew that there was an end to this. They knew this was a closed door right now, but there's an open door coming. <laughs> and when this war's over, man, these doors will be open and no man will be able to shut them. <laughs> Because they had that firmly in their heart, they were able to stand with joy and face the suffering of the moment. And I thought, how 
true is that for you and I? When we really comprehend, when we really understand what Jesus just said in, in Revelation 3.12, I mean, go home, read it for yourself. To those who are victorious, to those who have stood, to those who have done all, continue to stand, who've got to the end of the journey and you continue to stand. To those who have stood the test, you'll be a pillar in the temple of my God. And I'm going to write on them a new name. I'm going to write on them their eternal, pure identity of heaven. This is something, but this is a hope in your heart that must never, ever run dry. Because this hope can fuel you through the hardest of days and give you a joy in the darkest of moments. Because you know that whilst there's a closed door now, if I recognize his authority, then the open door is just around the corner. Can we close our heads? Can we close our eyes and bow our heads together? And Father, we just thank you for this time we've been able to share together today. And Lord, you know who in this room right now is facing a closed door. Maybe it was a medical diagnosis, maybe it was a. Uh, uh, a situation at work where they feel they've been pushed to one side or within their families. Maybe it's a, a disappointment or a hurt with a person. Lord, you see the closed doors. Maybe there was a promotion or an opportunity they thought was theirs and it didn't come their way. It went to someone else. And they're not happy about it. Lord, we this morning just come and recognize that you are the author you are the author. You are authoring. You are writing my life. And I submit myself under your authority this morning, under your authorship. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Just my heads about and eyes are closed. If you're here this morning and you've been feverishly trying to write the story of your life and you've just come up against roadblock after roadblock, things have stood in your way and you really wanted to write a happy chapter and it feels like someone else has, has, has uh, in a sense, taken the pen and, and, and you didn't want this, but it's there now. This morning, I'm inviting you to surrender your life to the one who loves you so much that he faced his own closed doors, who is the author of your life. And the way to get the most authority in your life is to submit your life under the author, Jesus, and the finisher of your faith. Just wear heads about and eyes are closed. If you're in this room right now and you say to me, John, you know, eh, I'm not really submitted to the author of life, but I need to. I'm trying to write my own script and it's just, I keep messing it up. But this morning, I, I really want to submit my life under the authorship of the one who sits upon the throne forever and ever, for the one who's promised to make me a pillar in heaven. Then if, if you're in this room right now and you go, hey, that's, that's yeah, I know I need to do that. Then while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, we're in this moment of just reflection, we're in this moment of just thinking about what the significance of the word is in our life. And that's you. And you said to me, John, would you pray for me? I mean, I'd be honored to do it, really. I'd be honored to do it. I think it'd be one of the greatest privileges of life is to pray for people in those moments. And if that's you and you say to me, John, I want to submit my life under the Lord. And you're in this room. Just, just give me a wave and go, yeah, that's me. Just right where you are. God bless you. Someone else, just give me a wave right where you are. God bless you. Someone else, just give me a wave right where you are. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Lord, you see the hands that have been raised here in this room this morning. And you know what that means in terms of the heart and life of those people. Father God, as we surrender to you, as we take the burden of the authorship of our own life and we lay it upon you and we say, Lord, you are the Lord, I'm not. You are the orchestrator of life, I'm not. And Father God, I pray that each person receives the peace, the salvation that flows from the grace of your throne this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you, cheers. So good to see you, hey? We're so glad that you could join us for our Centro Church online service. If you did want to connect with us, don't forget to scan the QR code and fill out your details.
Also, if there was something in the message that stood out to you and you'd like to say yes to Jesus, then scan that QR code, click the Say Yes to Jesus link, and one of our pastoral team will get in contact with you this week. We hope and pray that you'll join us at one of our live services next week, either at 5 Pring Street, Ipswich at 9 a.m. or 5 p.m., or at our Collingwood Park location at Woodlink State School at 10 a.m. Blessings from our senior pastors, Pastor Tim and Pastor Catherine Spark, and all of the team here at Centro. Have a blessed day.